Just spending his days looking at old cannons, daydreaming of the battles that took place between the French, British, uh, Caribbeans, and Arawak, which sparked his imagination for storytelling and writing. Anderson came to the United States to play basketball, but realized he was more like Steve Urkel than Steve Nash. <laughs> and if you don't know who Steve Nash is, you probably know who Steve Urkel is, so there's your, there's your comparison. Uh, Anderson married a coal miner's daughter from Kentucky, and he now lives in West Virginia. And it's my pleasure to welcome our first featured reader, Anderson Charles. Okay, if I talk too soft, just let me know. I have a tendency to trail off sometimes. Our brothers just call me Andy. Hey. Only my mom calls me Anderson, and that's when I'm in trouble. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if I don't answer when you say Anderson, Anderson, I'm thinking I'm in trouble. But uh, uh, the book that I wrote, uh, I'm a dirty immigrant. Uh, it tells uh, the story of me from the islands, just a small tidbit from the islands to uh, living in America. And the premise of the book really is to show that we're not that different. We don't make so different. Uh, when you strip the culture, the politics, everybody wants to see it to be peaceful and live a happy life. So I'll just give you. I'm just starting from the beginning. I, I don't like reading stuff, so I'm going to just tell you all the story. Now, uh, I never really thought about coming to America. I actually thought about going to England. Oh, okay. I never really thought about coming to America. I thought about going to school in England. My mom lived here at the time, and that's what's on me taking the basketball scholarship. All right. It comes east most on the planet. <laughs> but uh, uh, just to give you a tip of where I'd come from to what I thought when I was king, and I'm going to tell you all about the American, uh, they call it an intervention, but when you're there, it's an invasion to you. Uh, it, uh, it started uh, Tuesday, October 25th, 6 a.m., 1983. Uh, I was sleeping, and I heard what, something like elephants out in the outside. I lived like, at the time, I lived like 10 miles away from the airport, and I heard what the thought was elephants, you know, but then that was followed by gunshots, and I realized it was the anti-aircraft guns that were going off. Uh, that's what they call them, elephants, because they made noises like elephants. And uh, I still didn't think anything of it, because at the time, after the four years of the revolution, we had gotten used to like gunshots and those anti-aircraft guns with it. I lived next to a field. Uh, where they did military training. Uh, they just called me a play gun, so that's what I called it. Because <laughs> most of the people doing it, I went to school with them, so I never really took them seriously. Uh, but uh, the thing that got me to my feet was the planes, uh, the huge planes. And I guess they were carrying like jeeps and stuff uh, that was flying over. And our houses, they were really small and built with concrete and brick. So we could feel it, uh, feel it shaking and stuff like that. So I remember going out to my window and looking outside and seeing people floating down from the sky, which I've never seen before. So I'm freaked out. And uh, later on, I found it was the 82nd Airborne coming in. And uh, the funny thing about that is, for years after, I thought it was just a dream I was having of seeing them shooting them people with the, the soldiers with the anti-aircraft gun with them about body parts and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a dream, and uh, this is not even a book, but the ironic part about it, I was working with somebody, and I, I used to work at Toys R Us at the mall, and I was working with this gentleman, and he was there, he was in the Navy, and he was there and he said when people came to the ship, they were talking about their friends getting exploded in the air. From the, the And I, for the longest while I thought, that was just a dream I was having, I didn't realize that I actually witnessed that because I sort of detached myself from the situation. But uh, I remember that morning, that was the, the most afraid of the made that morning. I mean, we had the revolution and uh, the subsequent socialist government of all that. I wasn't, I wasn't afraid then because most of these guys I went to school with, so I didn't be afraid with them. Even though they were walking around with guns, which we'd never seen before, because not even the police have guns on the island. Uh, not even now they don't carry guns. But uh, that was something else. 
Now that first day, I remember turning on the radio and the very first song that was playing on the radio was Bob Marley's Ambush in the Night. Mm -hmm. And that's the song they were playing there and the, the commentator, <coughs> Troy Garvey, this is another funny story, I thought he had died there because they blew up the radio station with him in it. But years later, I was working here at Amazon and they were allowed us to listen to the radio and there he was on the radio. That's like <laughs> 10 years later, I didn't even know he was still alive. Because I left like three years after, I didn't really see too many people. I pretty much stayed to myself. But uh, the next song played was Get Up Stand Up by Bob Marley and Peter Tosh and all those guys. And the commentator, it was going to sound kind of silly, but the commentator was screaming, get rocks, get machetes, get anything, fight back. And I remember thinking about, who am I fighting against? Because we had just had a coup d'etat where uh, the prime minister at the time, the one that we liked, he was executed by the communist fraction. So I remember, <laughs> I remember going to get my rifle and sitting in, uh, in my living room, and I'm wondering who's going to come through the door. Who do I shoot? Do I shoot American soldiers? Do I shoot my friends? Or or even the Cubans who were living on the island because I lived like right next to them. But they were drunk, they weren't gonna fight. Those guys could drink like you would not believe. But you know, a lot of people would say, Oh, well, we were fighting the Cubans. No you weren't, they were drunk. <laughs> but uh no going forward from that day I remember the night, the night or something else. The, they had these flares, these orange flares that would light up the night and you could actually see like animals running in the jungle and stuff. They were what we call a jungle, it's more like a forest. We don't even have dangerous animals on the island, except for the humans. But uh, <laughs> that was just sitting there at night. But I'll be honest with you, I was smoking a pound of weed a day. <laughs> That's how I got to it, you know. I was, I was chain smoking, you know. I mean, I sit in my veranda and watch the firefight going on, AK 47s going off here, M16 going off there, and you know, the, the fire from the muzzle. And I, I wasn't really scared at the point, I, was, I guess it was just too high. <laughs> but uh, that was the first time. That was the first time I got called in. I got thrust to the ground, put a gun to the back of my head and called him, call me in his head. That was the very first time that happened to me. And uh, that was, it sort of changed the way I looked at the world after that because nobody ever called me that before. Because my country is like 86% black people and we don't call each other that there. And so that was kind of a, and the funny part about it was an African-American soldier that did that time. <laughs> So, you know, yeah, so I'm laying there on the asphalt, and on the island, the asphalt melts. It gets so hot there. So I'm laying in the melted asphalt, but it's standing on the back of my head. And I had some, certain incidents like that. I remember, well, we got evacuated from the island, uh, from my city. I live on the southern tip of the island. And we got evacuated from there after about a week. And uh, I remember driving, and this is another thing that, uh, that, that struck me too. I remember driving with my brother, two brothers, was, was somebody else in there too. And I remember the soldiers stopping us, and there was this 18 year old kid, an American Marine, and he was so scared, he was shaking. And uh, my brother, of course, he thinks he's the big shot, he had to talk, and I was like, just shut up and hand him whatever you want to hand him. <clears throat> but the thing that struck me the most there is, I, I was scared, because I was his age, and he's scared too. And uh, I don't understand why people romanticize wars. I do not get it, because there was nothing romantic about being scared of their chief. And not scared because I think he was evil, but scared because he's scared. And when you're scared, you react, you know, so you in certain situations. But, uh, no, it was there. During all this conflict, we had all the Protestants come to the Netherlands. We didn't, we didn't have too many Protestants, it's like 80% like Catholic. And that is how I ended up talking to somebody about a basketball scholarship, because I was seven feet tall, 
which I didn't understand because I was 147 pounds. So I was pretty much was a stick. You know, and he was talking about I was playing on the national team, I wasn't really serious about it. But then the education is something good because where I'm from, education is top. It's like 98% of the degree. Everybody knows the school in the school because even to be the garbage man, you gotta have an education. But um, and he started to talk to me and uh, posted well to go to Stanford. I didn't know much about Stanford then, and then that fell through. So he said, hey, let's go to Kentucky. I said, okay, I'm going to see some cowboys. <laughs> That's what I thought because of all the horses and stuff there. And uh, when I, uh, <laughs> I landed in Kentucky, all right. They call it Kentucky Mountains. Not what I expected because, you know, on, you see the movies and you see these big cities, you know what I mean, and bustling and everybody's running and doing stuff. And then I ended up in the mountains of Kentucky. Nothing. I mean, yeah. absolutely nothing there. The place was so small at the time that the college closed down. When, it, when uh, people leave for the summer, the businesses shut down there. That's how small that place was. And we we'll talk about culture shock because I went from an 86% black country and I'm in the middle of Kentucky. And I can't understand a word they say. And I can't understand what they say, son. For some reason, they all call me son. <laughs> I couldn't figure that out, you know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> And it was hard to understand them. Uh, the, the trip from, I landed in the airport in Miami. And uh, the first thing that hit me when I landed in the airport in Miami is I look around and I noticed like guys walking around with guns and they're wasting uniforms. And I was like, is there a war going on here? And somebody said, no, that's the police. And I personally thought that's the movies. They don't walk around with guns like that because you can see that home. And that was like an introduction to what's going to be coming. That's what I was like. Uh, but anyway, uh, a preacher and a coach came to me, and we drove all from Atlanta to here. And, I mean, my country would walk it in a day. So imagine sitting in this thing, driving for hours, and it's like, oh, are we there yet? And I remember the, the thing that got me the most is the mountain ranges or the rolling hills. I always thought it was the ocean, because that's what I was used to. You know what I mean? I can't be, I couldn't believe that. It's so huge, and it's all land. Yeah, you know, I thought the Ohio was the ocean when I first came here. Because <laughs> our, our, our rivers there were just streams. Uh, but uh, we ended up in Kentucky, and I remember my introduction to fast food. Because we don't have fast food on the island. We have a Kentucky Fried Chicken, but that's the only fast food restaurant that's there. And I remember he said, are you hungry? And I said, like, yeah, I'm hungry. I just had that, flight, that long flight. And he pointed to the row of food and said, Wendy's. I see McDonald's, I don't know what this stuff was, you know. But then I saw Kentucky Fried Chicken, I was like, chicken. Yeah, I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course it wasn't the I was like, I don't know what I was expecting. Because you know? when we cook chicken in the islands, it's all got all these leaves and spices and stuff. It was nothing like that. Uh, but that's what I ate. And the curious thing about it is they keep telling me, yeah, there's a black ball thing at the, at the uh, at the dome, you know, I guess they thought we would have some kind of synergy or something. Oh, he's black, you're black. Talk. <laughs> Walk in there and he said, hey, this is Junie. Junie was like five feet tall. I don't know why he came on basketball. <laughs> but uh, Junie was like, it was a really small college. It, was, uh, it wasn't even NCAA, it was NAIA. Uh, and uh, the first thing Junie said to me was, what's up, dog? And I was like, who just call me a dog. Not the mouth, because you know where I'm from, you don't call people dog. <laughs> okay, I'll give you an example. I don't, I don't know how many of you all know who Snoop Dogg is. He decided, oh, I'm going to be a Rastafarian, and the Rastafarian said, well, you can't call yourself a dog. That's why they call him Snoop Lion, because where I'm from, a dog is not one of the cleanest animals. Like, I didn't see a house dog until I came to America. All of our dogs live in the veranda. Yeah, you know, they weren't allowed in the in the living room or nothing like that, you know. Here I am living with a dog, you know. <laughs> Dressing it in a skirt and all that. That was my ex-wife. <laughs> but uh, so he said this to me and I'm like, Damn And then he started to talk, he was from New York. I didn't understand a word he was saying. All I was doing was this. <laughs> so but uh and I learned a lesson too, uh, the, the, the culture shock is, is something else. I learned a lesson that African Americans and uh, Caucasian Americans, they don't speak the same. See, because when he said, what's up dog to me, I said, hey, it's America, everybody talk the same. 
So I met this girl and I said to her, what's up dog? And she slapped me. And I was like, <laughs> 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 what's going on with this here? Well, then I went back to the basketball business and said, oh, that's our thing. Said, what do you mean our thing? You're all Americans, right? All the same, yeah, you know, it's all the study. So then, so then I had to watch what I say a lot. <laughs> Which is really bad because most people can't understand what to say anyway. <laughs> so here I am watching what to say, but still trying to get the point across. Uh, uh, the language, I remember the first time the coach talked to my mom, she said, he asked her, what language is he speaking? And she said, the Queen's English. <laughs> yeah, no, so the language barrier was, was really big, but the more I live here, like I've lived in New York and Nashville and stuff, but more so here in West Virginia, there's a lot of similarities to where I'm from, to here. There's a lot of working class people working hard to make it. And I always try to tell people, I'm not that different, but that's as much as you think. The only thing that makes us different is what we are taught to be, not who we are. Like we're humans, that's who we are, all of us. You know, we all want the same thing in life. We just think that a certain ideology is going to get us there. Obviously, it doesn't work. We have three ideologies go boom, boom, boom in my country, and we still pull. So obviously, that's not working. We've got to start with the human. And that's the premise of the whole book. We all have to start with the human aspect of things. Not forget everything else, because you could be proud of where you come from. Like, I'm proud to be Grenadian, but that doesn't make me any more or any better than anybody else. Yeah, you know, I'm bringing up to the human aspect of things, and I think we we'll all have all that other stuff. Really yeah, you no, know, and uh, during the war back home, during the revolution and stuff, that that, that idea was building as as, as the years go by. It's like, we, you know, what's the difference here? Now, they have some issues with the. Uh, Stereotyping. Some of you all know I had long dreadlocks. Oh, he's a drug dealer. <laughs> I got that all the time. People would come up to me and say, hey, can I get the good cocaine? And I was like, I've never even seen it done before in my life. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've never been, I don't even take aspirin. That's, that's, how, that's how, uh, how much I don't like medicine. You know, most of what I do is uh, medicinal. But uh, the, the stereotype. Or I'd have people drive by me and go <laughs> because they see me wear the colors and stuff like that. I'm not a pothead. <laughs> I might have smoked a pump the day, but that was for a reason. <laughs> but uh, another stereotype too is of course to being tall. It's a little stereotype that you know, where I'm from, everybody's tall. My grandfather was seven feet tall, seven feet five inches tall. My mom was six three, my sister was six three, I have a brother that's six eight. So pretty much everybody was tall. Of course, too, there was a flip side. I had a, a cousin that was three feet tall. <laughs> That's on my dad's side. He was only five, six. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the staring. I still have a lot of issues with the staring. You were going to tell the kids. Like, when I was growing up, and I know some of you all know, your parents tell you, don't stare at anybody. You know, he works, they work with me. They know. This people come to the line every day, like, <laughs> sort of fly in the mouth or something, but uh, I, I never got stared at at home or anything. Not because everybody was this tall, but you know, just the stare. So I had to get used to the attention. Playing basketball in college, I never understood the idea of wanting my autograph. That was really weird for me, and I'm living in Kentucky. You know. Basketball came please. I remember walking. Uh, from the library to the dorm, which is all for all the to come from the library. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, and, and uh, a busload of kids drove by, and I didn't think anything of it. I'm walking, and then the bus came around, and about 20 kids jump off this bus. And they all had papers suddenly so up at me, and I was like, what do I do? What do I do? And somebody said, sign it. <laughs> Why? <laughs> But they want an autograph, you know. Whereas when I'm home, they go, oh, that's just Tall Joe. My grandfather's name was Joseph, so they call me Tall Joe, like they call him. But uh, the hardest thing to get used to was being a night heart. It's the hardest thing to get used to because, you know, where I'm from, there's black doctors, black lawyers, black priests, you know what I mean? And then I came here and I went to Williamsburg, Kentucky. And 
there was very little people, um, very little minorities there. And then there was just one grenade. So I was like a fish of the water. And it's, it's really odd. I married a coal miner's daughter. She was the only person I could understand. For some reason, I could understand her perfectly. So she was a translator. She would always translate for me and everything like that. Uh, she still is to a certain degree. He's still in the translator sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know if I've assimilated. I don't think you could fully assimilate into anything I really don't. But that's okay as long as you understand that everybody else is human and they get along. And really and truly, that's the most important thing, I think. Now, uh, the book itself is in different segments. You know, it's a, well, how I wrote it is thoughts. Like, something happened to me, if it's just a paragraph, I just wrote it, I'll put it in there. Something that's 10 pages, I'll put it in there. So it's, there's no, well, some people might say consistency, but consistency, sorry, to it, but I just wrote the, the thing that happened to me, I just put it on the paper, and I left it at that. Hence, maybe that's where it's self-published. Because <laughs> everybody wants everything to be, you know, and I, I really don't write like that. But, uh, I would encourage anybody here to do some traveling because before I came here, I had an issue with Americans, and then when I came here and I met Americans and not tourists, uh, that's when I started to realize, wow, these people are just like me. And Mary Max was one of the best things they ever did because then they were hard-working people, uh, Christian people, you know, really good people. So I learned a lot from them too. Yeah. I definitely would not survive this. If I uh, didn't meet her, I get to meet everybody at the meeting. I end up living in several different states in, in this uh, country. So, the advice I could give to anybody, or what I would say is do some traveling. And don't go to do the tourist stuff, you know what I mean? It's like I, I lived in New York and I've never been to the Statue of Liberty because I'm too busy talking to those people. It's, it's those people are more important than anything else. You know, so, when you go to the travel to the islands or you go anywhere, go talk to the people. Don't talk to politicians and, and, and leaders of society and so they're gonna give you they're gonna give you a smoke screen. You will talk to the people, they tell you what's going on, you'll know exactly what's going on. You'll see the similarities uh, with us, you know. And uh, the similarities are a lot greater than the, than what's different. So that's the best thing. I don't know how much time I took up but I didn't talk for too long. Thank you. Thank you.